<laughs> the bot. bot Brothers. Welcome to the show. This is the Bot Brothers AI for Educators. I'm Mike Pearson. And I'm Pat Burns. Today, I've got someone on the show that I've been um, following on Twitter or X. I, I don't know what to call it anymore, but I, I do like the idea that I can now send not tweets, but Xs, I guess. And just, it's kind of weird. Um, we have Anna Mills, who, um, if, you don't, if you're not following her, like, and you're, and you're interested in AI and writing, like, what a great resource. I've learned a ton from reading her posts and then, and then who she follows and, like, that whole, whole Twitter stuff. So we, we have her on the show. Um, I know some stuff about you, and I, I know that it seems to me like you're almost like a writing heavy, like in like the composition area. Um, I know you're out in California. I thought it was Marin, but I think that might be not correct. Um, and I'm in San I, Francisco. I, yeah, the San Francisco. Okay, so just you go. Do, do you go across the bridge to, to teach at Marin College, or are you at a different college? Yeah, so I've taught at I taught at City College of San Francisco for. 18 years. And then I've also taught at College of Marin and Kenyatta College. So they're sort of near San Francisco. And, and do you do all writing or you, you lit or like, yeah. what's your background? Mm-hmm. Like, okay. Well, no, I've taught literature as well, but um, probably more often I'll teach an introdu- introductory composition course or a rhetoric course. Okay. Um, yeah. Pat and I do a lot of rhetoric because we both do AP Lang. And mm-hmm. then when I was in grad school, I, I did like the first year comp sequence. So so like kind of sometimes your post, I'm like, oh, I I know where you're coming from. Yep. So this is for us, this is kind of a cool show. And I think for if you're a listener and you're an English teacher, like a writing teacher, like this is like a writing, a writing show is gonna be. Um, and you've done all this stuff with like, which we we didn't know about until we talked to uh, Eric Keen from my essay feedback, but the Libra text with the free mm-hmm. text. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like, like the like, resources. Hooray. <laughs> well, and I showed Pat the um, the the book you wrote that had all like the kind of like the templates that was kind of like they say I say but mm-hmm. arguably better and <laughs> well I mean what a great resource and you're just like here world right <laughs> you can have this and and it was a collaboration with so I think we had fourteen community college instructors from around California and we had three rounds of grant funding from the state to put that textbook together. Um, and the nice thing about OER is that you can also adapt pieces from other textbooks and rewrite them, um, and you give credit to the authors. And so it's just an incredible space to be sharing and creating textbook materials and course materials. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's fun. It's, I, I've been teaching for 20 years, um, 22, I guess, with college, and I never ever heard of it, which is. Yeah, it's it's not as common in, in K-12. and. Yeah, but I think it's it's kind of it's been growing quite a bit in higher ed and um I just fell in love. Um but yeah, it's you just put it out there and hear a world and and you can edit this and you can right. you know make your own set of templates that are based on mine and well yeah. and I think it's great about that, uh because I was looking at it the other day and, and Mike mentioned they say I say that's that's uh one of those texts that um we we've been using for a good number of years here but i think a lot of it was like somebody just came across the book at some point and then it's just kind of word of mouth and so maybe in the same vein once we have a chance to kind of process you know that whole uh all the templates you have and and i i could i saw some immediate uses uh that 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 would be great so and and if it's a little bit easier or easier to access for students then um i have no problem shifting over to a whole nother kind of uh way of doing things so who knows maybe start to kind of spread out here as well yeah, public high schools pulse a lot of stuff down from colleges, like especially writing stuff and rhetoric stuff. Like we're we're just like mm. take that, you know. Um, so like when there's a source like that that we don't know about, we're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> look, at, look at this, <laughs> you know. Um, because I mean, even even like that 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 um everything's an argument, the Lunsford text, uh-huh. like that's uh-huh. used in a lot of high schools. Mm-hmm. There's a yeah, big, we which, should really be com- talking to each other way more. I think in the first yeah. Time teachers and the high school writing teachers i know that's always true right it never happens right mm-hmm. um but so you've done that um your 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 work you did some stuff with open ai um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i want to get into that and i i also like kind of want to like i think pat and i have a kind of particular love for the northwest this is like kind of tangential mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. um uh this is kind of like a side note that pat was my reverend 
I got married 11 <laughs> years ago wow. and we got married on a Bring friend's this story. I so forgot. I so yeah, forgot. <laughs> so we'd, we'd done this bi bicycle trip from Portland down to San Francisco. And we got to San, San Francisco. My wife was there and, and we, we eloped. We got a license from San Francisco <laughs> and we went to Sausalito where my, my wife's friend had a, was living on a wooden boat. Uh, um, oh, and cool. we took it out into the water and Pat stood on the bow of the boat and married us. It was, it oh. was the most real thing to say by the power of me in the state of California. I remember that for, was it, it's been over a decade now. I still remember that line. Uh, it was just so bizarre. And there, I kid you not, there was, so they had a friend playing guitar. There was wine and cheese in the boat and there were actual dolphins coming out of the water. I'm like, what is going, it was the most, oh my it, it was like, and then there was a sunset. And there was fog crawling down over the, right. over the, river, over the mountains where um, Mount Amalpias is at. I'm like, this is uh -huh. nuts. <laughs> this is so cool. Oh my gosh, wow. yeah. yeah. Surreal. And for being on the Midwest, like that was that scenery was just oh, like. Yeah. It's such a fairy tale place, yeah. Sausalito. Yeah, beautiful. yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when, it, I, when I'd said it somewhere in your bio, like Marin, like as soon as I hear the word Marin, like all that comes back. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we're we're big fans of the San Francisco area, Northern California in general. Um, we got all kinds of stories from that trip. But anyway, so um, can you maybe? So I I know that you did some work with OpenAI before I was ever aware of it. Can you maybe talk a little bit about like how you got hooked into OpenAI and the large language model and how can you mm -hmm. or is there like, sure. no disclosure yeah. stuff where you're like i can't <laughs> no talk about no it. no i can <laughs> talk about it yeah yeah now that yeah that's way in the past there was non-disclosure but that was before gpt4 came out so okay um you know it was just a strange story because in june 2022 i was preparing a proposal for um the college conference on composition and communication that's the college on the NCTE, right? Um, I was preparing a proposal about my textbook and the approach of using, they say, I say style templates. And I shared it with my best friend who's a sociology professor. And she said, well, this is fine, but why don't you make it a little sexier? Why don't you talk about AI? <laughs> and I was like, AI? You right. know? <laughs> um, and so I started researching and it was kind of this overwhelming a sense of adrenaline for about a month, um, because even at that time, you could use basically something pretty close to the the level of chat GPT. Um, it just looked more technical. So working okay. with GPT-3 in the open AI playground was really not very different from what came along in November. But, um, you know, you had to get past that hurdle of like, this looks like coding. This right. looks like there's all these strange words and temperature and top yes. p and you just had to be okay with that being there you know and so i just kind of had this intense sort of crush and um you know went into the vortex of really uh jumping into the social media discussion that was already happening among educators there and um and starting to write about it and approaching it from this like well let's do this collaboratively let's make open resources about it let's talk to each other because this is clearly a big deal and it's very complex and exciting and scary and um, nuanced and all these things. Right. Um, so I thought, let's get a resource list together. Uh, let me play with this, see how well it does at creating essays. Um, I was on social media. I was also in the OpenAI developers forum. I just got on there and there really weren't many educators on there. Right, right. And so I, I think that's how... Um, the person from the red teaming process at OpenAI found me and just said, I'd like to talk to you about this. And do you want to be involved in red teaming, which just means the kind of the testing of the system before they release it um, for so that, possible is that, like, is, that like a beta? is that like a beta then? Is that essentially? Yeah. The, okay. Yeah. So they were testing you... that GPT-4 before they even put out chat GPT. Um, and before they released that more sophisticated model, um, which I think was what, in April um, of 2023. So they were testing it and um, and they were committed to kind of seeing how bad are some of the harms that could happen with, with misuse of this system and how can we, and still tweaking it before they released it to see if they could right. prevent that. 
So I was just one of a whole team of people um, who were testing for different kinds of possible harms. And as far as I know, I was the only educator, which, you know, I, I would have loved if they had opened that up um, to more involve more people. But I said, well, hey, at least um, at least there's one educator. I don't know. Um, and so it wasn't really what red teaming is mostly for things like bias and is it going to help you build a bomb and um, okay. and misinformation. But um, in this case, they said, well, we are also interested in harms to students and possible learning loss and what are the impacts on academic integrity. And um, so they just had me uh, write kind of a, a report about that and test specifically for how well it did on academic essays. Um, so I did that as a contractor for, um, for a few months. And, um, and then that just gave me a sense of like, um, you know, what is it capable of? You know, it still, of course, was not, is not perfect and still fabricates and still, um, you know, has the same problems as GPT-3 and chat GPT 3.5. But, um, but I got a, a more of a feel for that um, level of sophistication and how, as you prompt it different ways, it does do things that you thought it couldn't do, uh -huh. et cetera. Well, is it, uh, I know um, when we were kind of prepping for, for the show, I was I, you know, looking at your background. I know Mike knows your background a little bit better than I do, but um, you, you, I noticed that you had the, you had the article from the Chronicle of Hige Higher Education. Mm -hmm. um, this piece if for aud our audience, if they're interested, it's just called Chat GPT Just Got Better. Uh, what does that mean for our writing assignments? That was back in March. Right. I was really curious as to like, so I was reading through that and a lot of what was re written there, um, you know, I've kind of come to like, you know, figure out too, uh, but I wasn't sure if like since then, because it's been, gosh, six right. months almost, um, if you've noticed any sort of shifts, changes with ChatGPT or any sort of updates of sorts that, that could be spoken uh, to. Yeah, I mean, I would say the biggest changes. So there's no new model. There's no retraining because that's such a huge investment. And they've also said they're, they've said they're not training the next model because they want regulation to happen first. Mm. Um, but they have been bringing in all these um, plugins. So mm -hmm. what you could do six months ago is um, upload a file or ask it to analyze an image. Yeah. You can do that now with Bing AI um, yeah. or have the Wikipedia plugin. So it's um, so it's searching Wikipedia to inform its answer um, or, you know, the the browsing capabilities. There's math capabilities with Wolfram pl plugin. Mm -hmm. So this whole library of um, systems you can connect it to. Um, I think that's where there's a lot of new capacity and people haven't really got their heads around that you can upload multiple files to it and it'll just work with those files. It'll even sort of use code to do things with them and produce new files in different formats with its text. Um, and Ethan Mollick has been exploring a lot of that um, as yeah. a, yeah, online, the Wharton Business School professor. Yeah, he's a, he's a great resource too. Yeah, I'd love to talk to him, but I think he's maybe, right. maybe busier <laughs> than everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> well, so here's a question with that, because I've kind of wondered, with regards to so like like there have been like PDFs I've tried uploading before right there's a plugin yeah plugin. does that mean that that if you upload a PDF of you know some you know some file or whatever that that it's it's just text that 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 would also then also kind of help serve for training their systems to then or is it somehow I don't know if you can speak to that I don't know if you know anything about that. yeah um I mean my understanding but so when you look at the privacy policy if you're working with Chat GPT I think they can use that data to to they're not using it immediately to train their models, but they are maybe using it in some way to improve their product. It's a pretty broad permission. If you're using the API, um, they have a lot less leeway right. to do that. Um, so if you're using apps that build on top of it, then maybe they your privacy might be more protected. Um, and that what they can do with your data is, is more limited. Um, but but yeah, you can definitely, and it's not that, I don't think what they would do with the file is different than what they would do with your text, you know? So it'd be the same concerns about what what should I um, share with the model? Um, okay. So yeah. it's a little glitchy, 
I would say, the plugins. Um, yeah. and, and the other thing, <laughs> you probably found that, right? And yeah. it and it changes from like week to week, what's working and what's not. Yeah, it works um, really well and then doesn't. Yeah. The other big change is, is that um, Claude 2, so Anthropic, the company released mm -hmm. um, that model. So I've been using that um, lately as well. And, you know, you can upload multiple files there and it's pretty convenient and pretty probably parallel or close to the level of GPT-4. So I think that's that's a shift that we've Yeah, got I like that you can dump more into Claude. Yeah. You can like put, you can put a lot of text into Claude. Mm -hmm. you know um to, to work with it like i mean even for this show like i thought we'll dump the entire transcript into it and be like give us some yeah. you know, blah, 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 right and and with with chat gpt oh. you have to like divide it up because like it's a lot of yeah. text and it's kind of annoying um so i think it's only four you can upload can you upload documents to three 3.5 for chat gpt or is it only because I, I just use four I so tried. yeah i'm just using four yeah uh, but i know like with the with claude you know, you don't have to have a premium subscription to be using, like, I don't pay for that. Um, I'm doing it on po.com and I'm just, I haven't paid for that yet. Okay. Um, so I think they're, you know, this isn't necessarily behind a paywall at this point. Um, what have you, so I've, I've like played with spreadsheets and like low level data analysis, mm -hmm. right? Have, mm -hmm. you, have you done anything like when you're uploading documents, have you done anything that you're kind of like, oh, that's useful and cool. And I can use that with students or mm -hmm. I can use that with teaching, like any, any, anything or or just something that you did that you're yeah. like, holy smokes, it just did that. And I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. I just took like four blog posts um, from a group that I'm on and said, you know, write an update based on these blog posts of this length. And, and it did a pretty reasonable job. Um, although it was uh, a little more positive about AI than necessarily the group had been. <laughs> and I've noticed that over time. That, um, so, yeah, I mean, I did that. I, I took a, I downloaded all the comments from my resource list and I uploaded that and said, will you pull out the positive comments? Right. But I had to double check. Um, and I did find that it did some very strange things trying to count the comments. Um, so I think mm -hmm. like it can seem amazing for data analysis, but then you can't trust it. So it's a question of, is it actually saving you time and how, how much can I go back and check everything it just told me? Um, yeah. So I think it's kind of a, a messy picture. I know. I've, I've, I, I've spent so much time playing around being like, I don't even know if that's mm -hmm. right. And then, and, and then you used to <laughs> yeah. end up counting it yourself. Like I, I could have. Like last year, I was writing a, a rec letter for uh, a student teacher. And I was like, I'm going to see what happens if I, you know, have chat GPT do it. And so I, I had chat GPT four do something. And then, and I, I think I'd written something. And I, I think I asked the chat GPT to like, I gave, I gave it some prompts to like kind of tweak the letter. And then I had Quillbot, right? A kind of a different mm -hmm. system, right? Yeah, And I, I found myself getting basically like I had two different reviewers, I guess. I, I don't like to anthropomorphize the, 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 the system, but I was getting advice that was conflicting about what should be. In. And I finally was like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to write this thinking thing myself, <laughs> you know, because there was there was mm -hmm. too much information mm -hmm. that I, I, I really it, none of it was bad or great. I mean, when none of it was like like the information I needed, even though I knew what I was doing as far as prompting it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think the thing that was most useful that I tried was um, talking um, a brainstorm into Otter AI and then, you know, just having this huge mess of text that I really didn't want to read and yeah. then giving that and saying, will you pull out some main points from this? Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't use any of that text, but it really helped me focus my thinking for the kind of to begin the draft or the outline. Right. Um, so you yeah, and then sometimes I was pushing back. Yeah, yeah, I did like I do like yeah. Otter, but sometimes Google Docs just voice typing works too. So, right, yeah, there's that. Um, um, so, okay, so I, there's you said something about that was making me think of. I think it was with student rights. I I, I lost it though. I was thinking about um, critical AI and their and that Bill of mm -hmm. Rights um, 
because it wasn't the Bill of Rights, it was the Bill of Student Rights. I was just looking at that today. And you did you work on that as well? The No, I didn't. I have collaborated with them before with Lauren Goodlad, who runs the Critical AI Institute at Rutgers and the edits the Critical AI Journal um, from Duke University Press. Um, But I had just collaborated with her and with um, Katie Conrad, who is, you know, posting a lot of interesting stuff on Twitter, too. And um, I just fell in love with that document. It's based on the White House blueprint for an AI. for an AI Bill of Rights, but it extends it for education. Um, and I just thought it was, you know, some really compelling points made succinctly about what educators' uh, rights and are and what students' rights are in this situation and, and kind of restoring some dignity to um, our role um, and, and our kind of autonomy mm-hmm. and our capacity to grapple with this and and try to form the response and the appropriate use in education um, to protecting our privacy and our legal rights um, and saying, you know, w- you know, we can have expertise here and we should be listened to. Is, um, is, that, something, is that something, Anna, that, because uh, I, when I was reading through the document, I think the, the suggestions are, are, are quite good because they, they mentioned things like, as I just had this up, so for like, for like students, there's certain um, guidance on like privacy and creative control. Uh, they mentioned things like um, you should be able to appeal at academic misconduct charges mm-hmm. that are if you're falsely accused, which I thought was great because um, mm-hmm. we've cer- certainly seen uh, situations where students are, you know, in the media. You know, in, in um, uh, I saw a Washington Post article recently. I, I'm sure the Times has, has reported on situations where professors, uh, you know, have, have accused students of, of using AI when they didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess what I'm wondering, the, the document itself, though, is uh, there's a whole list of other things that people can check out, but um, that it's, it's aspirational. So is, is I guess my question is kind of two part, like one, uh, it's aspirational. So like, what, what are you hoping is kind of comes of this? Is it something as simple as just like mm-hmm. laws being passed? And two, if that's the case, um, you know, are, are you seeing any sort of traction with this with, with legislators or lawyers wanting to try to kind of push for this? Or is it uh, you, uh, I'm just kind yeah. of wondering because it's it's it, the concept. I think is great. It's new to me, but I don't know uh-huh. where where things stand. Yeah, yeah, it's a really interesting moment for this. Um, I mean, I think even the White House document was aspirational, but the mm-hmm. idea was always we're gonna we're gonna move from this into some more concrete policy, and that's what they're working on right now. Um, and you have this moment of you know tech companies are saying we need regulation and mm-hmm. um, the House and the Senate are saying we want to do regulation and the president saying yes. But the question is, well, how fast will that happen? What will it look like? Whose voices will be heard? But there is some momentum around it. And um, and as far as, you know, students and teachers, I think um, that document could inform administrative responses. And mm-hmm. as all the discussion about establishing policies should could take those principles into account. And, you know, and many doc, many discussions of policy are, um, but also, um, you know, the, the MLA and 4C's task force on writing an AI that I'm on, um, you know, we have, we made a public comment to the uh, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And some of us got onto a working group with the, um, the the NIST um what is that National Institute of Sorry. Standards and Technology? Uh, that, yeah, that's, yeah, that's correct. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we got into a working group that's about um regulation and policy around AI. And um so I think there's a lot of room for um for some work on policy, both at in, in educational institutions, of course, but also right on the governmental level and for us to talk with, um, you know, other people who are trying to make policy around disinformation and um, other kinds of concerns about AI, you know, concerns about academic integrity and student rights and educator rights can, can, you know, have a lot of overlap with those, I would say. Let me ask you a question. That answers your question. (laughs) Very robustly. I mean, I'm thinking like other questions based off of your answer, but Mike wanted, I don't want to, Okay. Yeah, the, well, yeah. the academic it's about, it's, integrity. It's about the task force. We'll, we'll come back to it. 
the academic integrity one is is a big teacher worry. Um, yeah. I, I think especially if you have not been playing playing with the system, right? Um, mm-hmm. um, the, the first really? time people, what's that? <laughs> You're less worried now that you've played with it than when you hadn't. I'm still worried. Um, I'm still big time worried. I would say. I. I uh, no, that, that's fine. Yeah, tell me what you really think. No, I mean, I mean, like uh, I've taught high school for so long that kids have always tried to get around stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Right. Right. And I, I right. think I've been thinking about this a lot. I think that the 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 distinction between one of the distinctions between college and university and, and high school is that the high schools have their we have our kids in front of us a lot mm. right so mm. like we see them right right in front of us you know where mm-hmm. at the university it's like here's an assignment now go home and do everything right so the right so right. that if i was a university professor or a college writing teacher i'd be like i would be more worried oh interesting yeah we're trying to pivot toward doing a bit more in class or at least i am and many people are not if not everything but saying at least let's have some in class formative writing mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Right, but you a lot of what high school do it. Yeah, right. a lot of what high school kids do is they're in front of you in a class. So you, I think you know we get we get kids five days a week for almost an hour a day, mm-hmm. right? So this is just a lot of one on like not one on one, but you really kind of get a sense of the kid. So I think that's why I'm not as worried. And now now I've got you know hmm. I've got like a lot of questions yeah. about employing it. Um, but so here's I I, I just. I'm not sure how to approach the question. And I, I kind of want to approach it through that tweet you made about your student mm-hmm. that like was not supposed to use chat GPT on a piece, but did. Yeah. It, it sounds like you're like, I, I think this is AI generated. And the student was just so excited about the piece. <laughs> yeah. Like, to the point where it sounded like the student felt like they owned the piece. Yeah. Yeah. He felt excited by the language and proud of it. And I think he thought of it as his own. And some of it was. Um, It was interesting, though, because even though I had said at the beginning of class that, you know, don't use it unless it's specifically called for, he he told me that he used it um, before I even read the essay. Um, And he didn't seem to realize that that had gone against the policy. Um, so there was this real earnestness and naivete about it. Um, Uh and I'm still, what I'm happy about is that we're still building trust and that I've met with him a couple of times and we've exchanged messages and he did rewrite it, but he didn't take out most of the text. (laughs) He took out Mm -hmm. the word semiotic, um, and replaced that. And (laughs) we talked about that, but he still, you know, left in big chunks of text and, so I, it's a work in progress, but I, I feel good that we we had this dialogue. I realized I needed to be more explicit and reinforce the expectations more than I had. Um, and I, I do think that he um, he maybe did still feels like he's built a little confidence and he's coming back from bad experiences with a previous class. Yeah. Um, but obviously it's not where I want it to be because he doesn't, um, you know, that's not his, that's not his voice. It's not mostly his ideas, mm-hmm. what he turned in. Um, but I love that he feels like that academic language that he somehow claimed it and that he is not shut off from it. Um, right. and that he kind of appreciates the rhythms of it and the complexity of the sentences and that there's a sense of attraction to that, that, mm-hmm. you know, is something I would hope students would would begin to feel as readers, right? Of, of yeah. that kind of text. Um, so it's very mixed. Um, but yeah, so I'm curious what your well, I, answer is to that. I, so I, I I keep on. I think I, I think I even tweeted this at your exit or whatever you say. Um, and, and by the way, Mike and I may not agree on this point. Just to be uh-huh. clear. <laughs> I, I'm looking at his face. I'm like, I don't know if I'm gonna like what it, or agree with what he's got to say. So, just... well, so like, so I come from a music background, right? And like guitar and and bands, punk rock bands, and all that stuff, and 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 recording music. And it would it was laborious. You'd have to practice, right? And know your instrument mm-hmm. and like know what you're doing. Well, not maybe not so much with punk rock. It's like kind of like I'll, I'll push for everything, but like just like to be a musician, right? To put something together, and you'd have to rehearse people, and 
and ha- to spend the time and all that. And then, and then uh, the internet happened and you could download like all these tools, like, you, mm-hmm. like, like, um, like acid pro, which was like a looping program and like all, and like, and sampling with all, all the hip hop people were doing. So they're just taking stuff and sampling and kind of making pastiche work. And you kind of generate this whole new music. You, know, you see where I'm going. I see you nodding. And, and um, all of a sudden you could like record all of the stuff in your basement by yourself through using loops and have a new creation built on little snippets of other people's work. Mm-hmm. Right. Like and, patch and, writing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is like when you, when you create music on a computer digitally, like, and you're using everyone else's like stuff that they've created, like their loops and their, uh, their, their riffs and all that. Like you didn't create any of that, but you put it together. You're kind of producing music, but you're not writing music. Uh-huh. Right. So, and then, and then, then you, at the end of it, you're like, I own this. I made this piece of music. Hmm. Right. And then, so then, then, here, I'm going to drive this even further. Like, so this, our little podcast, like needed a song. Right. So while my girls were in the tub one night, I got twin five-year-old girls. Um, I've got 10 minutes. I pull out my phone and I have an iPhone. I've never used GarageBand at all on the iPhone. And I pull it out and I just, I, I'm a musician, so I can figure it out. And in 10 minutes, I do the song for the show. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That In 1992, that would have taken me, get the musician, musicians together, write this stuff, rehearse it, record it blah, 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 blah. And I did 10 minutes and now it's like the podcast song, like whether you like it or not, but, wow. but someone might yeah. like it. They might be like, oh, that's a good tune. And I'm like, yeah, I, I, wrote, I wrote a good song. And literally what I did is I, I tapped on my iPhone, uh-huh. the, the chords, yeah. da, 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 and put a beat behind it and then and a bass line and boom, it's a song. And I keep on in my head, I'm like, is this where writing's going? That you just boop, boop. Boop, boop, essay. Here, Miss Mills, here's my essay I'm so proud of. Right. But I know that's the sound I make too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious what Pat's reaction is. You were gonna disagree, maybe. Um I, I there's a part of me that I like I hear where Mike's coming from that. I, I feel like um it, I think the problem that I have with that is. I'm not saying that there's not space for maybe a, a course where maybe that's kind of what you're tasked with doing, but mm-hmm. I, I guess I think of it, uh, and maybe this is a, a false analogy, but I, it makes me think about, so Mike's bringing all these music kind of uh, references and, and, and programs that can you can create stuff on your own. I think that's fine, um, but we still have orchestra classes. We still teach uh, mm-hmm. you know, band, you know, that, that there's still spaces for that. Um, and, and, and I think that's just the process of learning how to um, develop. I mean, there's the whole kind of critical thinking argument. Like, it, it, is the program mm-hmm. really, are you critically thinking or not? Or to what extent are you? Uh, so yeah. I think that's that to think about. But, um, you know, I think just the, the I, I'm really, I, I don't think it really is, I guess you could maybe create your own writing style, I suppose, maybe. But I, I think it really takes away one sense of voice. And when I talk yeah. to students where, where I'm a little bit, I, I'm certainly like concerned about plagiarism and students misusing or not using AI ethically. Yes, for sure. And so that's something that needs to be addressed in the classroom. But I guess I keep coming back to like, yeah, but teenagers love to tell you what they think, you know, yeah. and they really want yeah. to um, establish what their voice is. And, and it's like, great, let's do that. But let's kind of like do it responsibly in a way that like, that helps you kind of crystallize or clarify what you're actually trying to say and what you're thinking is. And I think AI can then be used as a tool in that regard. I'm not so sure. I, I think people who are, I guess, on one end of the spectrum, so worried that the AI is just going to go ahead and like, oh, you're going to go ahead and just type something in and just pass off as your own. I just don't really see that happening too much. Because even when I have conversations with my students, you know, be, giving them or them having the space just to kind of say something on their own terms matters at the end of the day you know and so yes you, you there might be some students who just don't care and they're not going to buy in it's okay okay fine but the vast majority i think genuinely want to try to uh, play around and try to you know, develop their own sense of self yeah. i think that that's really that's just part of what makes us human so 
Um, you know, I think there's that that Mike almost kind of argues on some level, uh, you know, the, the drive for, or desire for efficiency. And I think there is some of that, yes. But I think that, um, I don't know, I, for, for me, okay, so I'll say this. There was, a, there was an article uh, where a, some student from Harvard was talking about how she took, and we talked about this on a previous episode, where mm-hmm. she was saying, well, I want to use AI for whatever papers, whatever, just turn myself and move on. Because she was like, well, I'm here for, uh, what, what was the, the field of some finance thing? It was like hedge yeah, fund. Ven- venture, fund venture capital. Oh, uh-huh. Venture capital, yeah. yeah. So oh, she's like, that's okay. what she cared about. And, 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 and yeah, <laughs> but then but, th- but then I thought, I'm like, but that's not why I went to college. That's not right. why I do yeah. education. That's not why I learned. Like for me, there's a whole different ph- philosophical kind of angle that I take to my learning. And it's not about efficiency. In fact, it's in many cases the opposite. It's just messy mm-hmm. and just takes time and, and kind of a slow yeah. kind of, so to speak, or or, and, and, or slow to boil, and, and that's fine. Like I'm okay with that. Um, but we do live in a culture where efficiency is definitely valued, in, in certainly in the business world. And I think that trying to find ways to build, um, I guess, healthy kind of barriers or what have you with with yeah. edu- with an education, yeah. so that we're not overrun by that. Because I think that there's too much corporate speak in education to begin with, which is already kind of this. Um, I guess this uh, infiltration of biz- the business and mentality into, into education. I think uh-huh. we need to find ways to push back on that and focus more on process and not product. And so um, that's what I'm trying to, to achieve yeah. now. Now, not every student's going to do that or want that or care about that, but but I think that that's, a, that's an important value to uphold in our field. Definitely. And I, I don't want to send the, send the message that I think it's fine that my student auto-generated a lot of his essay. Right. Um, you know, that's not, and and I certainly focus on why are we learning writing? How does this help yeah. us think? How does this help us connect and communicate with each other and figure out um, what to do about things in the world um, and find our voices and all of that? Um, and so I think, I do think we need to create some relatively protected spaces where people are experiencing writing mm-hmm. without AI. Um, and we need to make it sort of we put some barriers and guardrails up um, and teach the writing process and um, build in relationship and peer review and talking with students about their ideas as well. And um, all those things and, and some form of accountability, I think we, we do need. We don't want it to be biased and we don't want it to be inaccurate and lead to false accusations. And I don't want it to be punitive. I didn't impose any negative consequence on this student. I still haven't graded his paper. He's supposed to still rewrite it another mm-hmm. time. Um, and I'm not interested in, in punitive, but I am interested in some guardrails and some sense of accountability. Um, so we create a sense of protected space and incentive to, you know, because it is hard and it is frustrating sometimes. And that's part of the process. And we got to have students have that experience of getting through that and getting to some reward or some clarity or some sense of their voice that they didn't have before. Um, so, yeah, I think we we do need to create some protected space, but without judging and penalizing yeah. the students as I, we're figuring this out together. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I thought that was interesting when I was looking at that. So, cause you're on that was the MLA. I don't know what the CC. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and communication is that it yep that's it well so so that joint task force on writing an ai like it, it gets into mm-hmm. that idea of, of not trying to uh to police essentially right or surveil discipline punch i think is what they say that surprised me i'll have to say if only because my bearing i think growing up maybe it's just you know the impact of my teachers is that i always felt like it was almost like a like just shy of a crime to like you know, mm. mess up on a, on a source citation. And in some respects, I guess that, that's protected me through the years as, as, a, as a student and as an academic. But, um, but I was surprised that MLA seems to be okay with that language that, that, because it seems to me that, that they, would, they would, not that they want us to police, but that they want us to be, definitely be very strong and firm about uh, making sure that students are citing properly. But I do have my mm-hmm. questions about how do you cite something that you can't really regenerate or, or kicks out different results every time, but um, I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, enough. I think it's a work in progress. I mean, they have set out guidelines for citation mm-hmm. and, and you can share the record of your chat session, which I think is helpful. 
as a as a web link. Um, and you can give the date of your generation and the prompt that you used. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we could also acknowledge that whatever it's giving us is based on human written text that it was trained on um, that aren't identified. But um, I wouldn't say that the task force is saying it's it's fine and students should do whatever they want um, at all. But I think it's part of this bigger discussion in higher ed about academic integrity and concern about systems like Turnitin that um, right. may be using student data. There's privacy concerns. There's concerns about bias against and whose work is being flagged as um, as possibly AI and how is ed tech profiting off of, you know, they want to sell this detection system mm -hmm. that's not very accurate and that is biased and that leads to, you know, may lead to false accusations. Um, of course, Turnitin doesn't, you know, they try to educate people about what it is and what it isn't. But um, and there's just con larger concerns about a culture of policing. Um, but um, I think that we're still we're working on a, a new working paper, hopefully, in the task force. Um, about policy and about um, how we might approach this um, question of academic integrity that in a way that's not punitive, but that still um, creates some, some accountability and some clear guidelines about ethical use of sources that builds on right the, all these academic values around source citation and giving credit as part of this larger conversation um, of around knowledge. So, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't I wouldn't say we're cavalier about it at all. Um, yeah, I, I didn't mean to suggest that it was just more. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I'm sorry I came across that way. I, it wasn't my intent. It was just oh, I, I, I remember I, reading that thinking. Yeah. Well, what is that? I, I guess just because my my teachers are so heavy handed. About it. OK, like, yeah, well, yeah. Contrary to what I, I would have expected to say. So that's all. Um, I think there's a movement in the other direction, so it's kind of swung, and and we're still trying to figure it out. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. It, it seems like the old bind of, and and the working paper, the four C's task force on writing that working paper. Um, mm -hmm. I actually I read it, annotated it, and left it on my desk at school. <laughs> but so I pull up the, the 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 PDF. But there is this in the introduction. There's this great language of an AI cannot simply be used in colleges and universities as it might be in other organizations for efficiency or other purposes. Uh -huh. Right. To this end, we believe the primary work of educators is to support students' intellectual and social development and to foster exploration and creativity rather than to surveil, discipline, or punish students. So there's like a lot of important stuff in there, but I think that line about other organizations for efficiency, right? Because like mm -hmm. the the mm -hmm. non-education world is going to use this product to make things faster, to make a podcast song, right? Like to like to 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 10x your whatever to like mm -hmm. go faster to do more marketing to get more Twitter storms going, like to do whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the it's the it's the kind of like the the ongoing continual like educational bind that like teachers were educators were trying to teach. But you have like a mass public or mass media or mass politician saying, well, education should be about getting jobs. You should be doing job skills, right? It, it should be something that gets you something. Like you hear a lot of that language and that's the language of efficiency, right? So if the mm -hmm. reason, if the people say the reason you go to school is to get a good job in the end and that your goal is that job, then you do um, anything possible to get there, right? Which goes- right which goes against the whole like, well, no, you're going, you're going to school to learn and to think and to connect. Mm -hmm. And it's all the stuff that writing in the humanities really works on, right? Is, mm -hmm. is, is those things. And so when I was talking about like the garage band thing, it's just like, I keep on being like, I, I know from teaching for so long that the public pressure is going to be like, well, why can't my kid just use, the, why, why do they have to do this? Yeah. Why right. do they have to read this book? He he can just have he she they can just have uh, whatever AI system read it and spit out the main points. Like, why do you have to do that? They you know like that kind of like you don't mm. get it from every parent. Like, if there's parents that are like, we we don't want our kid using AI, right? But like mm -hmm. that's like the the tension I'm feeling. And I and I and when I think about like, man, are we going to get to the point with writing where you can just hit buttons and it spits something out like GarageBand? Oh. 
Well, yeah. I mean, slow a kid down even more, you know. But that gets to that point that you've been making about process. And, you know, when we do writing in education, it's not because we need those essays. Right. Um, it's it's to give a space for an experience of of thinking something through and putting the ideas together. And so I think we can make that case even more clearly to students um, and maybe invite them to reflect more on what they're getting mm -hmm. out of that writing process. That's something I want to do more of in my teaching. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, wondering if the writing shift is less about the product at the end, like the shiny essay that has your yeah. super cohesive argument and not about like, just show me your thinking and all of its sloppiness and goodness, like all at once. And then we will learn how to clean it up. Mm -hmm. Or it's a tool to clean it up, but like, show me your thinking. And, and that's the, 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 the strange thing about chat GPT is that it's pretty good at helping you generate ideas, right? So it can yeah. potentially cut off the messy hard work of just getting an idea. I mean, one, one thing that I think is really exciting is the, the fact that um, this critical AI literacy, the idea of understanding um, where these models can go wrong and uh, what we need to look out for and what problems come up is both very practical from a workplace standpoint. And it sort of helps us understand why we need to do our own writing and thinking and build those skills. It, it kind of gives us space from the models, but it also would help us work with them in a future where they're part of the workplace. Um, so I think like to me, that's something a lot of people can agree on is that we as teachers, we can be creating more opportunities for students to see what these systems get wrong and to have experience recognizing, you know, it said this, but that's not what I wanted to say, mm -hmm. or that's actually a fabrication or that's biased. Um, and, and just practicing that because that's where you're going to bring value in the workplace and also where you're going to develop a healthy sense of, I want to do my own thinking and my own writing sometimes. Right. Um, Okay, so let me let me kind of close out the show. There is so much more to say. I want to have you on again and again um, because, like, <laughs> oh. writing stuff specifically. So it sounds like there's some good things. Like there is the kind of these aspirational documents that might get turned into policy, and there's some momentum on these, and there's people starting to talk about like let's figure out how to put some 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 guardrails around how we're using this and managing this and and protecting uh, students and people from it. Um, it sounds like there's uh, a, still a real concern with plagiarism and how it's going to impact writing. Um, but it sounds like there's a lot of people really working on these problems. Um, it, it sounds like we're still kind of going to be in this mix for a while, right? But but now there's like sources coming out. People are finding the sources to start kind of kind of uh, figuring out how to work with all this stuff. Um, and it sounds like we all kind of agree that maybe what might come out of this is that we we go back to like doing things slowly because there's a value in the thinking and the and and the conceptualizing and the doing things slow and just generating something really fast is not the point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we go back to the the purpose and the intrinsic meaning of of that writing process. Yeah, yeah. which maybe there's an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Anna, thank you so much for coming on our our little podcast. We really mm -hmm. appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been great. <laughs> all right, all right. Thanks for listening. As usual, if you like the show, please share it, like it, tweet it, check our social medias. Pat's got the Facebook. I've got the Bot Brothers on Twitter. There is a lot of uh, stuff referenced in there. Our talk with animals. What a powerhouse. If you're interested in any of those links in the MLA, 4Cs, Task Force release paper, that'll be linked on the RSS site. If you're interested in the Educator Student Bill of Rights, don't think I said that right, that's going to be linked too. We also referenced Critical, Critical AI, the journal out of Rutgers. We're going to actually have a Dr. Goodlad that runs the show over there for Critical AI on the program, I think the next episode should be super interesting conversation i hope you check that one out again thanks for checking us out share us with your friends have a good one